Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, third in the three-part series of uh, how we build the future of work in the Citrix workspace with the intelligence features. Uh, my name is Peter Froese. I'm the lead domain specialist uh, working on the workspace intelligence team. Uh, we've gone through uh, sessions that talk about how we organize and plan, and now we're going to get into some more detail on how exactly it's built. Uh, first off, just a quick reminder that uh, a lot of what I'm showing you today is uh, still under development, even though we've uh, uh, released to GA, uh, and a lot of it is subject to change uh, based on, you know, new additions to the code. So um, if anything does change, that's uh, you know, covered by our standard NDA. Uh, the things that we're going to be going over today is how we configure the data integration providers uh, in the workspace admin tool. Uh, and in addition to that, I'm going to show you how exactly we build micro apps, both for configuring notifications uh, when connected to those integrations, as well as surfacing the data in the, uh, in the workspace blades. Uh, and then finally, we're going to get into some essential skill sets for customization. Uh, at the end, we're going to actually do some building of a custom micro app uh, against uh, a web service uh, provided by the, uh, the OData JSON standard so that you can see exactly what our HTTP connector does so that you can uh, build your own integrations against any system uh, that has a REST API, but uh, we do not provide an out-of-the-box integration for, for Citrix Workspace. All right. So I'm going to be doing a live demo, a uh, live walkthrough very soon of the Micro App Builder, uh, but just as a brief introduction of it, uh, it is our no-code drag-and-drop tool for configuring the integrations, uh, setting up who is subscribed to those integrations, uh, setting up the authentication for how an end user would log into the workspace, uh, and then configuring all of the parameters that would trigger a notification, specify who, who receives those notifications, uh, what they see in the cards, and then when they click those cards, what data they see pulled from those underlying systems, and any actions they can take on them. So it's a very powerful tool. It's uh, meant to be very intuitive, so I'm going to walk you through that so that you can see exactly uh, how these integrations are built for various systems. Uh, there are a lot of uh, customizable templates that are included uh, out of the box with, for, the, uh, for the integrations that are included as part of the GA release. Um, and, you know, we hope to, you know, demonstrate just how easy it is to make a lot of, uh, you know, changes and additions to the micro apps so that you can see exactly, uh, you know, the power of this builder. So the steps that we're going to be going through, first off is uh, adding a new integration. Uh, in the first walkthrough, uh, I'm going to be doing one with a, a sample integration with uh, concur expense demo data. Uh, so you'll see how we would uh, be doing the connection to the underlying system of record. Uh, then we're going to be creating micro apps on top of that integration. Uh, and then we're going to be doing some customization of those micro apps. So you'll be able to see all the components that are available that are either tied to the data that's, uh, uh, that's accessible via the API for these, uh, or any you know, customizations or formatting that you can apply so that the blades that come out when you click those cards look exactly uh, how you want, uh, both on desktop and mobile, and then also how to configure the actions for those, uh, for those cards so that when you execute an approval or add a commentary, uh, that, it, that it sends the right note of, uh, information down into the underlying system of record. All right, so without further ado, let's uh, step right into the micro app builder so you can see exactly how it works. Okay, so what you see here is the end user interface. For the micro app console, this is how we would be specifying all of the uh, configurations for integrations, as well as the notifications and pages that make up the micro apps. Now, the first thing that I want to show is how authentication systems are set up in this system. Uh, this identity and access management tab will take you to the place where you can configure a variety of different systems that are available so that end users can log in to the, uh, to the workspace end user experience without having to, um, uh, it, by integrating into the existing SSO systems that, uh, that you already have at your companies. Uh, in the case of this uh, development environment, we have the, uh, the Azure Active Directory set as the, uh, as the IDP of choice. Uh, you can also use a, a cloud connector and use Active Directory on-prem. You're able to use Okta. And then through the Citrix gateway, you would be able to do an integration um, uh, with uh, Ping or some other uh, on-prem hosted IDP solution. 
The configuration is relatively straightforward. When you open one of these to connect them, there are several standard parameters that you'd be able to enter. I use Okta as an example because the configuration of this is quite similar to how we would do a configuration for one of our systems of record. Uh, but it's fairly standard. You'd just be entering a URL, a token, a client ID, and a client secret for this, uh, for this identity provider. The parameters are a little different for each one, but uh, you know, based on whatever you know, credentials are required, uh, you would be able to configure that within the workspace. Now, if we step out into the services, this is the main console, and I'm going to go back into the specific micro app service manager. And when you click that, it takes you to a launch screen where it specifies, you know, the very simple steps that are required for building out a micro app. So first, you would need to add a new integration, which is basically specifying the connection credentials to the system of record that you want to create the integration with. Then you assign micro apps to it. And finally, you customize the micro apps that you've built. So if we go to the manage section, this would show a list of all of the integrations that have been created already. Now, for the purposes of today's demo, I'm going to be using this SAP Concur demo environment. But if you wanted to create something brand new, you'd hit this Add New Integration button, and it brings up a list of all the integrations that are available. Now, say you wanted to connect to a ServiceNow instance. If you click on the ServiceNow button, it brings up a dialog that would uh, give you access to all of the parameters that you need to enter to connect to a cloud-hosted ServiceNow instance. So in this case, the URL the username and password for the service account that's been provided, and then you can specify if you want to use OAuth2 for the uh, individual user authentication tokens. Uh, the interface looks a little bit different based on each of these, but it's uh, a fairly intuitive interface for all of them. Uh, just based on the credentials required for each system, you just have to enter those uh, different credentials and you'd be able to set up and sync one of these, uh, one of these integrations. I'm going to go back to that demo integration that I had set up for SAP Concur. Now, one thing to note uh, from the start is the synchronization that's set up for this. Uh, it's been mentioned in previous, uh, you know, when we were discussing the architecture in previous webinars, that uh, you're able to set the polling interval for when the workspace would pull data from the underlying system of record. So if I click the synchronization button, you're able to specify both the full incremental sync, uh, the, sorry, the full data sync as well as the incremental data sync. Full sync takes a, a brand new fresh copy, whereas incremental sync just takes any data that has changed since the last sync has run. Uh, and you're able to tune this on a per integration basis. So say, for example, you have a ticketing system where new items are being created and existing items are being edited all the time. You'd want this to be a fairly tight interval, like every five minutes. Whereas if this is a company directory and the data is not changing very often, you could run it once a day or even once a week potentially. So this can be tuned you know, based on the needs of the, uh, the integration itself so that you can have uh, as real time an experience as you would want for the, uh, for the notifications coming from the system, but also be able to tune to minimize the number of API calls made to these systems of record. All right. Now, if you wanted to add additional micro apps to this once it's created, if you click this, you'll see that there's a variety of template micro apps that's included. In the case of uh, Concur, you have an approvals app and a submit quick expense app. Depending on the integration that you've created, uh, there are different template apps that are available. So in the case of ServiceNow, there's a very long list of potential micro apps that are available. Uh, just based on very standard workflows that we've seen at clients over and over again for the sorts of interactions that they would have with the ticketing system. And these are available for Salesforce, Ariba, and many of the other integrations that are available out of the box with Workspace. Now, going back to our Concur demo, one other thing that I want to point out is exactly what it looks like under the hood. So in this section, you get to see what is actually being built by this integration provider. And the core of this is the tables, the relationships, and the actions. So what actually happens when we do a sync is that the integration provider is creating a, a relational data model that mimics the object model of the system it's connecting to. 
So in the case of Concur, uh, it's an expense reporting system. So the objects are expenses, allocations, items, and there's also travel modules in Concur. So you see all these various travel items as well. So all of these are represented by tables in this integration. And in addition to that, all of the relationships between the different tables are described within this as well. And all of this is included out of the box with these integrations. So because using this, uh, using all of these tables and all of these relationships between the tables, we're able to pull the data in to the micro app cache from, you know, via the API calls, uh, and then surface that in the micro apps. And one other thing that is inherited from these integrations is the actions. So in the case of the expense reports, there are two actions. One is the uh, approve reject, and the other is create quick expense. So here the parameters for the actions are defined, so you can specify exactly, you know, so you'd be able to pull from a micro app, uh, you know, exactly what the report ID is and what action you want to take, whether it's approve or reject, uh, and specify that in any write back sent to the system of record. All right. So now that we've gone through exactly what the integration has and how we would add additional micro apps to it, now we should step into one of the individual micro apps so that you can see exactly how you would be building and configuring these. So I'll use the approvals micro app as the example. If we go into edit this, the key sections here are notifications and pages. Notifications is how you would configure uh, the contents of a card as well as what uh, changes in the data would trigger the creation of the card and who receives the card. Uh, pages is what would configure the contents of the blade that pops out when you click on one of these cards in the Workspace desktop app or the Workspace mobile app. So first we're gonna look at the notifications and I'm gonna focus on this new request changed. We edit this one. So this is where you would specify where you're looking for the data change, as well as uh, what uh, particular conditions you're interested in, and specify who would receive the notification. So at the top here, you can specify when, you're, when you run this check. And in this case, we want to run it every time there is a full or incremental sync on the SAP Concur demo data. And for this particular notification, we're looking for a changed record in the Concur demo, in this, uh, sorry, a changed record in the Concur demo, and we're looking at one specific table. In this case, it's the reports table, and we're looking not for any change in any record, but for changes where this particular code becomes equal to this hard-coded value. You're able to specify any number of conditions here, uh, and because Workspace takes a snapshot, uh, because Workspace has access to both the previous snapshot and the current snapshot of data taken from that system of record, we have what we call the language of change. So we can actually check to see if something changes or does not change or becomes a particular value. So we're not restricted to the standard SQL equal to greater than, less than. There's a lot more flexibility in specifying what the conditions are. Once all of those conditions have been set, then you can specify who receives the notification. Now, if this is a broadcast uh, micro app where it's gonna inform all the people in a particular building that the building will be closed because of adverse weather, then it would be sent to all subscribers. But in this case, this is a notification to a reporting manager uh, that they are supposed to uh, approve a particular uh, expense report. So in this case, the notification would go to that one user whose email is a match to the email address uh, specified as the approver in this, um, uh, in this particular, uh, for this particular expense report. So that's how we would be personalizing the notifications. And once all of that is set, then you can configure the contents of the cards. Now you can see there's a live preview on the right. Uh, it looks very similar to what you've seen in the end user demos that have been shown in previous webinars, uh, where you can specify the title uh, and you can pull data from the underlying record that triggered the notification and insert that into the card so that uh, the user gets as much context as they need to execute the approval. So the dialog for this, you're actually able to pull up you know, any of the columns from the main table. Uh, and you can see here this related column section. This ties back to that relational model that I mentioned before. Since there are several other tables that have a relationship to the main table, you're able to pull any of the data from any of those tables as well. So you can include as much or as little data in this as you need. And then you can apply formatting to it as well in case you need to 
uh, you know, make it look like a currency or uh, convert a date time or something like that. And finally, if there are actions associated with this particular card in the, uh, in the target uh, micro app page, then you're able to include them on the button. Now, uh, sorry, you're able to include them on the card. Now, say for example, uh, you know, compliance requirements make it such that uh, you would only want to allow somebody to approve something if they have viewed the full data that's included in the full micro app page. In that case, you'd be able to just simply remove these buttons from the card and uh, the user would have to go into the full data in order to execute the approval. Whereas if there are cases where it's okay to, to do it from the card, uh, then you can include them here. And finally, you're able to set the expiration conditions for these cards. So typically you would wanna set it such that, you know, if the underlying record that triggered the notification is deleted, that it would disappear. Uh, you can also set time conditions or add conditions based on the status in the, uh, of particular fields. So in this case, if the code changed to a particular value, uh, then you could have the card expire. So you don't have old irrelevant cards staying around in, uh, you know, in a feed. So the idea is to build a feed that is very targeted, very personalized, and very time relevant. And this is what you're able to do with this, uh, you know, very intuitive interface here for, uh, for building these notifications. Now, when a user clicks on a card, they're brought over to one of these micro app pages. And in the case of these cards, they go to the review report page. So I'm gonna open this one for editing. And here you'll see the basic form factor for what a micro app page, uh, for what our micro app page builder looks like. Uh, just to give you a quick tour, on the left side is all the components that you have available to you. Uh, so some of them allow for text input, some of them are static, some of them uh, are for actions, uh, some of them are for display purposes only, so you can add formatting with uh, static text or headers or embedded images, uh, and then some are for layout. So as you can see in the middle here, this is a flex grid with two columns and three rows so that you can have six items arranged in uh, you know, a very uh, aesthetically pleasing manner. In the middle, you get a live preview of exactly what you're building, and you're able to drag the components from one area to another to, to make it look exactly how you want. And then if you click on any of the individual components, you're able to see all of the properties that you can set for that particular component. So in the case of this text area, you can see which table it comes from, you can see what, uh, what column it's referring to, and you can see the formatting on it. Uh, and in addition to that, if there's any actions that you want to specify for when that particular field is clicked, or if you want to add some logic to this particular field to show or hide it based on values either in that field or in other fields on the page, you're able to configure that as well. So there's a lot of flexibility as to, uh, you know, how everything looks and what fields are displayed. Now, this is the template micro app. So it just includes these particular fields. If you decide that you need to expand this to be, you know, two fields longer and pull those, pull those additional fields in, you'd have the flexibility to do so. Now, one other thing that I want to point out is uh, the configuration of the actions. So this particular approve button here is tied to, um, uh, is tied to the approve service action. And what you're able to do in the builder is actually stack uh, multiple actions on top of each other so that you can have uh, multiple things happen with a single button click. So in this case of uh, the approve, the main action is this approve reject report action from the SAP concur integration. Now, uh, I showed you earlier that inherited action and the two parameters that were associated with it. And this is where you would actually be configuring those parameters. So you can, you can pull the report ID from the data that's linked to this particular page and then you can specify this approve field as a, a true false Boolean because that's the required value. And that's all that you would need to do to uh, submit that, uh, that service action on, on button click. So that can all be configured from here as well. You're able to specify what message shows if the validation or action fails, and then as well as the success message. And then you're also able to specify uh, that an event runs afterwards um, if, if there's some other action that you want triggered on the back end of this approval happening. All right. Uh, and one other thing to note here is that if you look at the, uh, if you look at where the service action is pulled from, you can see that even though this micro app is focused on concur, uh, that uh, you can pull an action from any micro app. 
uh, sorry, you can pull an action from any integration. So if, for example, this was, uh, uh, this was uh, an action button where I'm requesting time off from a system like Workday, uh, you could theoretically configure the button such that it takes the same data from this page uh, and submits it both for requesting time off in the HR system uh, and also sending it to Google Calendar to block off time uh, with a calendar event uh, in Google Calendar. So you'd be able to actually stack multiple actions on a single button uh, because you have access to all the different actions from this, uh, from this interface. So this allows for you know, a lot of flexibility in, in setting up the kind of integration that you want, depending on uh, you know, the workflows that are available uh, or the workflows that you do in these particular systems, and then how, you know, what mashups there are between the uh, you know, different systems of record when they interact with each other in, for example, an onboarding process or a time off request process or, uh, or things like that. And that's uh, you know the high level overview walkthrough of the um, of the micro app service. Uh, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit to walk through exactly how to build the HTTP integration. But first, I want to go into a little bit more detail on you know what the HTTP integration is and why we have it. So what about the other integrations? Uh, as part of the GA release, there are about a dozen systems that are included uh, with out-of-the-box integrations and template micro apps for workspace. That includes a lot of commonly used enterprise software systems like Concur, ServiceNow, Ariba, Workday, Jira, and things like that. Uh, but there are a lot of other enterprise software systems that aren't included on that list. So what is our strategy for getting to all of those systems as well? So we do have a roadmap for building a lot more data integration providers, but uh, the plan is not to create an, an integration for every single application available with an out-of-the-box template because there's just too many. And even individual companies can be using hundreds of different apps in very different ways. So it's very difficult for us to build a, a one-size-fits-all solution across so many different applications. So our solution for this is what we call the HTTP integration. Now, what is it? So this is a special way to create uh, a data integration. Um, so it's generic and it's similar to the AP, uh, a lot of API clients that you know. And if you've ever worked with a, a tool like Postman, then you would probably have a pretty good idea of how something like uh, the HTTP connector would work. So what can you do with it? Well, you can configure API calls to pull the data out and update systems of record. So you would basically be using get calls to pull data out or put and post calls to write data into those systems of record. Uh, it can talk to REST APIs, and that's a fairly wide standard for you know, connecting with cloud-hosted systems. Uh, you can configure multiple different authentication options, uh, pagination whenever there's large data sets being returned. Uh, as well as full and incremental data synchronization, very similar to the out-of-the-box micro apps. Uh, it can consume nested JSON and OData JSON responses. So the focus here is on you know, that structured data that's returned by these, uh, by these systems. Uh, and as you saw when I was walking through the, uh, the, micro, app, uh, the micro app builder, uh, everything on the back end is a table and then the relationships between those tables. So as long as the data from that system can be consumed as a series of tables and then you can manually build the relationships between them, then you would be able to build a micro app off of it. Uh, it does have the ability to connect to on-prem systems as well. Uh, the prerequisite there is that you would need to have uh, what's called a connector appliance installed in the data center where that, uh, that on-prem system resides. Uh, and that connector appliance would essentially provide the plumbing uh, to, to, to communicate between the on-prem system uh, and, the, and the cloud-hosted Citrix workspace. Uh, the data would be pulled from that underlying system into the cloud-hosted Citrix uh, micro app service cache, very similar to the way the out-of-the-box integrations work. All right. So as you can see, this is the list of all the various integrations that will be available out of the box. But that question mark box there, uh, that could be any number of different systems. So it's essentially up to the developers uh, that have familiarity with the APIs of the systems, as well as familiarity with the underlying data model uh, and the workflows that need to be built uh, in the workspace for those event-driven and user-initiated workflows. 
So those are the people who would be able to, to take that and make this custom integration uh, so that they can build micro apps on it. All right. So the custom integrations are enabled by this HTTP connector. This just gives you uh, a rough idea of exactly what the architecture is. So if you look at the target system, uh, if it's cloud hosted, the HTTP integration sits as a, uh, essentially an adapter between the target system and the micro app service. Uh, it consumes that JSON data, uh, convert and uh, streams it into the micro app service and would be able to take any requests from the micro app service for doing any, uh, any reads or writes and relay that onto the target system. And one thing to note is that uh, not every target system would have uh, you know, a, a web service or REST API available. So a very good example of that is if uh, somebody wants to build a micro app that communicates directly with a database. So there's no database integration that's available, but there are several uh, web service wrappers that can sit between the HTTP integration and the database so that you can execute the same sort of uh, you know, create or delete or update commands into that, uh, into that database via the web service. So those web service wrappers are something that would potentially be required if there is no REST API available for the target system. So now that I've given you a, a brief introduction of what the HTTP integration is, I'm going to do a, a live demo of what one of these integrations looks like using a, a sample web service from the, uh, the OData standard. So we're back in the micro app management console now. And to create the HTTP integration, first we go to the Manage section and click on Add New Integration. And this time we want the HTTP integration. I'm gonna specify a name. And we need to specify the base URL. Now this is a very common parameter that would be required for a REST API integration. So typically there is a base URL and then there are multiple paths off that base URL that provide the rest of the data. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to be using this uh, service that's provided by the OData standard, and I'm going to be using this read service as the base. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this link and paste it in here. Now, just so that you know what is available from this, I open this up. You'll see it's shown in XML format here, but this is kind of a standard uh, web service response. And you can see that this is for uh, a fictional company that has a variety of products, details on the products, categories, suppliers, and people and advertisements. So we're gonna try to pull some of this data into a micro app uh, and then display it in one of the micro app pages. So going back here, you see that uh, we have the option to add authentication methods. Uh, there are basic NTLM, bear, and OAuth 2 available. Uh, this covers a lot of the authentication standards uh, for various REST APIs. Uh, in this case, uh, just for simplicity, uh, there's no authentication required for the system I'm integrating with. Uh, and then if you wanted to have separate user authentication for actions, you could enable this as well. Um, this would be uh, you know, just a quick reminder. Uh, the way the workspace system is architected, uh, typically the service account for an integration provider is read-only and would pull the data at a regular interval, whereas any write-backs done to the underlying system use an individual user's OAuth token um, so that, uh, so that any, any write-backs look the same as if they're done in, if they're done in workspace or if they're done you know, directly in the target system. So you would have the ability to set that up here. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, then you could also have it set such that the, uh, the service account does the writebacks, uh, and then you'd have to specify a field in there that, that indicates who the logged in user is. But just for simplicity's sake, we're going to just use read only with no separate service actions. Okay, so now we have the blank shell of uh, a brand new integration here and we need to specify our first data loading endpoint. So I'm gonna click on the add data endpoint. And first you need to specify an endpoint name. Now if I look at my options, I'm gonna go with uh, products so I can pull up the product data. Now, if we actually went to products here, 
you'll see that the response is, you know, not particularly human readable in a browser, but this is the structured data that comes uh, uh, back on the wire when you send a get, re uh, a get request to this particular uh, product's endpoint. So what we're going to do is configure the exact same, uh, configure a connection to the exact same endpoint. Now in this case, no parameters are required. Sometimes you could actually specify individual parameters similar to how they'd be uh, uh, specified in a URL uh, for a GET request. Uh, in this case, they're not required, but you do have the ability to do that. Once you've specified the endpoint, you can go ahead and click Test Service. And we've gotten the, the 200 response, which means everything's working as expected. And if we take a look at the response body, we'll see that uh, now it's a much more human readable version. And you can see this is the, the, uh, the, the structured OData uh, JSON that we need to, uh, to, to configure this web service. So in this case, it looks you know, fairly uh, you know, standard product information, bread, milk, soda, cola. So let's see if we can get all of this data into a micro app. And the way we would do that is by clicking the load tables button. Now, a couple things to, uh, to, to show you before I go ahead and do that. Uh, in this case, there's, uh, there's so little data that there's no need to do uh, incremental sync or pagination, uh, but you do have the ability to specify these. Incremental sync, again, is the ability to, um, if the data changes uh, regularly, uh, you can set a sync interval and it would just pull any data uh, that has changed since the last sync. Uh, and then for pagination, if you had a large data set that comes in on a full sync, then you'd be able to um, break it up into more manageable chunks to be parsed by the, uh, by the web service. Um, so now that all these configurations are set, I'm going to hit load tables. Now what it's done is create a table in this, uh, you know, the, the relational object model that I've been referring to earlier with the demo set. Uh, but you can see here that all tables must have a primary key and it's not set here. So I'm going to look into the attributes. Now what you can see here is that based on that response from the web service, it has inferred what columns are available in that uh, nested JSON data structure, and it's also inferred the type for all of those data based on the contents. So all I need to do here is specify which field is the primary key. In this case, I know it's the ID, so I can specify that. If any of these are wrong, I would have the ability to edit them to the correct value in case the inference was incorrect, and then go ahead and click Save. And then once all that's done, you can see here that uh, it's happy with my primary key, and I can go ahead and add the table. So now in the data loading section, I have the products endpoint, and if we go to tables, I also have the products table set up. Now, you would have the ability to set up relationships between tables as well. I'm not going to do that here, just, uh, you know, in the entrance of brevity. But if you had multiple tables and wanted to specify relationships between them, you'd be able to pick the table from the multiple tables configured, specify an alias, and then choose which fields to associate between them for the primary and foreign key. And you could actually have multiple columns uh, affiliated if there's a, a compound key required. All right. So that takes care of setting up the basic uh, data load. And now I'm going to go ahead and create a, a very basic page off of, that, uh, off of that endpoint. So if I go back to main micro apps here, so you see the webinar demo integration has been created, but there are no micro apps here. So I'm going to click add micro app. And for the out of the box integrations, uh, you recall that a dialog will come up and it'll show the template apps available. But for these integrations, there are no template apps. So when you click add micro app, it just creates a blank micro app for you. So we'll go ahead and edit this. First off, we'll give it a better name. And give it a better icon. And save those. Now, uh, there's no notification set and no pages set, but I will set up a page. Now, you have multiple choices for the pages. Uh, the detail and form here, the main difference between them is that one is editable, one is view only. Um, basically, what these do is show the, uh, the, the, the various fields that can be pulled from the API and displayed in these pages, uh, very similar to the, uh, the review report form from the Concur demo that I was showing earlier. Um, in this case, since I know the data is uh, tabular, I want to go with a table, and I'm going to call this, ta I'm gonna call this uh, page product table. 
And I'm going to specify that it pulled that info from the webinar demo integration that I just set up and the products table, and I'm going to choose which fields I include in it. Now, all the fields are available. I'm going to go ahead and say I want all the fields, but I don't need the ID because that's just an internal key, and I don't need the OData type. Everything else will be included. I click Set Fields, and that's all added. And I click this button, and that will create this very basic page with an embedded table that shows the same data that we saw in that uh, JSON response earlier. Now that we have this, we can use the, uh, the, the drag and drop tool to customize what we're seeing in here. So if I go ahead and click on this table, uh, let's see. First off, I don't think the discontinued date is particularly relevant, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And then I think the name should be the first column, so I'm going to drag that above description. And then this price here should look a bit more like a dollar value. So I'm going to go ahead and open price and look at the formatting options and set that to decimal. Now, we would have the ability to add, you know, as many other fields as we want that are tied to either this data or related data. You know, you'd have the ability to just click on those, click on those fields and add as many, as many of them as you want to build out the entire micro app page. You can include action buttons and configure them very similarly to the one that I showed you in the previous demo. And you can also configure, uh, you know, any formatting on it, any actions to be taken, as well as logic to hide or show it based on the contents of the micro app. All right. So if I want to do a quick preview of this micro app to see what it would look like for the end user. So this is what the table would look like. You can see it's exactly as we built it. This is what uh, the blade would look like if a user clicked a card related to this table. You can see everything's included with the, the exact formatting that we applied, uh, as well as those additional buttons and text inputs that we added at the bottom, even though those haven't been formatted yet. Okay. So this gives you an overview of what is required to build a very basic HTTP integration from scratch. Uh, this was done relatively quickly because it's a fairly uh, simple setup, but if you had something with more complex data, more tables, uh, more relationships between them, uh, as well as actions that could be configured by a put or post, uh, then you would be able to do that within the tool as well. Uh, and you could create uh, micro app workflows that are very similar to what are, uh, what are available in the, uh, the template apps in the out of the box integrations. And that concludes our third in this series of uh, webinars on how to uh, organize, plan, and build the, uh, the, the future of work with the Citrix Workspace Intelligence. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to enter them in the text or uh, ask them now, and we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. And now joining Peter today to help answer any on incoming questions, we have Greg Hayes, Sue Wang, and Renji Wang from the Domain Specialist team. So let's go ahead and dive on into the questions. First step, what if I have a workflow within one of the out-of-the-box SOR, but it is not an out-of-the-box micro app? Would we still be able to configure it? Hi, this is Renji Wang speaking. And the answer is, it depends if the SOR or the system of record has API or REST API capabilities for that specific workflow, then yes, we will be able to make a custom micro app if we already have the out-of-the-box system of record integration. All right, so next up, what are the technical requirements for a custom integration or micro app? Uh, hi, this is uh, Greg Hayes. Uh, so for each custom integration will require a service account to be able to read 
the HTTP REST API endpoints. And then ideally, we'd also include a, as long as it supports OAuth um, for write backs, then we can configure that as well um, to write back to the system. And then obviously, it's making sure we have the right endpoints exposed, both to read the required data and to write back the uh, service actions. Awesome. So next step, are there specific prerequisites to each out-of-the-box integration? Um, so yes. So this is Sue speaking. For each out-of-the-box integration, there are different prerequisites associated with that system of record. The things that are kept constant are the service accounts that are used to read the data from the system of record, as well as if you would like to write back to the system of record, you would need the OAuth token configured as well in the integration. Awesome, thank you. And then finally, are there plans to expand the list of out-of-the-box micro apps? Uh, yeah, so as we proceed down this micro app and workspace with intelligence journey, uh, we're planning to ideally use our engineering team to develop two to three out of the box connectors per uh, ideally per quarter, and then also leverage our uh, partner network to help expand the, the list of uh, out of the box connectors as well. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions that we have so far. Um, so thank you everyone so much for attending, and a special thanks to the presenters and all the panelists. Um, this recording, along with the parts one and two, Recordings will be available to watch um, on demand in about a week or so. Um, one and two are already available on the registration page. So be sure to rewatch those, check them out, share them with your friends. Um, and also, if any questions pop up as you continue your journey down the intelligent workspace, um, always pop into any of our office hours. We'll have team experts on hand that you can pop in and ask questions to at any point. All right, well, that's all we have for you today. And again, I appreciate everyone's time and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.